Welcome to Scott Hall Podcast, back after what could only be called, I think, the most complete and certainly the most satisfying Cougar football win of the now half-completed, time really does fly, Bobby, uh, 2024 Cougar football season. A, a really awesome one, one that happened to fall on probably the busiest work week of the year for both uh, <laughs> both co-hosts uh, of this show, but time waits for no podcast, certainly not this one, certainly couldn't not come back here and talk about it. an incredibly good Cougar football win. Uh, obviously, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the game itself here in a bit, Bobby, but you were there for this one in person. How was how it like finally finally seeing kind of the proof of concept? I mean, you you, had, you were at the Oklahoma game, which was, I think, a very, a very mm-hmm. good effort, one that wasn't that far from getting a win. Probably our third best performance, maybe even second best performance, I'd make the argument. Oh, yes, yeah, so I'd, say, I'd say second, just considering the opponent. I mean, yeah, he beat Rice and... Yeah, yay, yay! We didn't lose to Rice two years in a row, but yeah, no, I mean, that you definitely the top two performances this season, including this one, number one. What was what was that like in person, man? Dude, it's great. It's so much more fun to watch Cougars win in any sport that they play. It's just a better, it's just a better experience, you know. I, it, not to not to compare to the two sports or anything like that, but it's a lot more fun when you win a game versus when we lost to TCU when we lost to TCU in women's basketball, like it's just a lot more fun to go to those games. Tech, it's more fun to go to a game that you win where you kind of dominate an opponent over even a great, a, a good performance like we had at Oklahoma. It's, and it's always fun to be the fan on the road as long as you're not an asshole about it. Right. Cause you can sometimes get a little too far as long as you're a little self deprecating and you're not, um, you know, being too rude and in their face about it, you can usually have a pretty good time. And uh, that right there, same is what we call growth, because uh, about 10, 12 years ago, I might not have said the same thing, but it actually is a lot of fun. You meet some cool people and you, you get to see what their fan bases are going through and what their fan bases kind of think of us, not as a fan base, but of our team. Yeah, you can get kind of that outsider perspective. You could start here from his audio. Bob, Bobby is coming to us live from, uh, from parts, from, Parts unknown. We're treating it like it's a big state secret. A, a city in Tennessee <laughs> that shares the name of a uh, ancient Egyptian city uh, as well. I am I am in my home base, but I am. Uh, am I, you never heard of Memphis? Oh, th- now it's not a secret anymore, buddy. <laughs> oh, there, there we go. There we go. You're, you're making a face like, like I, this, I didn't know it was an ancient Egyptian city. I'm do- public I'm school. To you. Public People- school. Pu- Public school, you were a private school kid. Those That's are the fair. things they teach you in private school. That's fair. Uh, coming coming to you from uh, from not so parts unknown. Uh, me coming to you from not so parts unknown, but uh, but in my work shirt. That's just how how busy of a, a week this has been. And uh, got, got of course mention here real quick. Our good friends at Charlie Hustle, CharlieHustle.com, makers of incredibly comfortable vintage collegiate wearables, including a great collection. Of Houston Cougar wearables, use our promo code PAWD15, that is POD15. In doing so, you will save 15% off your order from Charlie Hustle. You're going to look good doing it. I'm, I'm going to a uh, a happy hour from this busy work week, and I'm almost certainly going to be wearing uh, one of my fantastic Charlie Hustle tees. a little bit more casual affair than the one I've been at the last couple of days. Uh, of course, support our friends at the 1012 Network, our network partners at TEN12 Network, wherever you do social media. Uh, I believe that is all the housekeeping here. Oh, patreon.com slash sh podcast for as little as 16 cents a day. You can support the work that Bobby and I do here on a weekly basis, talking about your Houston Cougars. Like many of you have done, we have seen an uptick during the season and we appreciate those of you who just joined us there and really, really appreciate those of you who've been with us for now a number of years. It feels very surreal to us here. So got to get to it. The happy main subject of our podcast, a 30 to 19 win by your Houston Cougars over the TCU Horn Frogs. And I kind of knew this one was different. I mean, you, you couldn't know this from the first drive, but you finally in this one, the first, you know, after the last game, you, you move the ball more than you would think a 34-0 game would indicate against Cincinnati, but it wasn't a good offensive performance, however you sliced it. And Iowa State, yes, you had you had a couple of painful near scoring opportunities or near misses in that one, but Felt like an honest shutout. It felt like a game where, yeah, the zero was indicative of the level of offensive success that you had against Iowa State. And it did never really felt like, even after that first drive that stalled out on fourth down in TCU territory, 
at that point, I was like, well, at least we moved the ball. Like, I'm not going to say I got ahead of my skis after one drive. But I was like, okay, I don't think we're going to get shut out today. And then emphatically saw that four different scoring drives in the first half. I like four different scoring drives in the first half. It was really, really incredible stuff. TCU did have points to get back into it. But my biggest picture thought, Bobby, before we do our you know, annual se- or for this season segment starter with our three overlooked plays is that it was a 30 to 19 win and it wasn't one that the Cougars were fortunate to win. The Cougars were very much the better yep. team in Fort Worth on Friday night. And that, and that was cool. That my big picture thought is this is the first time since, you know, now in our second season, of the big 12, much as I enjoyed the two big 12 wins that we got last year, the West Virginia, Hail Mary and winning Baylor and OT. Those were extraordinarily close games like this. This was not one. This was one where you won by two scores. Yes, TCU had chances to get back in this, but you never trailed one by two. It scores. never really you felt in doubt. Never, yeah, never really felt like. Yeah, you know, I'm a paranoid Cougar fan, so I'm not gonna say when it was 24 19 and TCU <laughs> the ball that I wasn't clenching a little bit. But you were the better team. I don't think anyone would debate that one, buddy. So I think kick this off. So you usually do. What are your three overlooked plays from uh, the Cougars' victory over TCU? Yeah, so just kind of some of my high-level thoughts, too, is I thought this team looked really good, right? The offense actually looked like it clicked. There were times, right, and I remember texting you uh, during the game, which is always fun when you're at the game and somebody's watching because you can't text them right away when something happens. you got to give it, like, 45 seconds, right? you got to be like, all right, the next play is about to run. Man, that's crazy. So, anyways, um, which was actually funny when I was walking to the stadium because I didn't get there for kickoff. I, I missed, like, the first – two, three minutes of the game. Uh, I could hear them announce the play that just happened while I had it up on my phone. But um, you could tell the O-line started to get beat a little bit. And that's kind of in that second, third quarter when the offense really started to slow down. Um, You could see the pressure was starting to get home a little bit, which got a little concerning there. And you could see the offense really stalled when that happened. Um, I think we scored, what, three points in the third quarter. Um and, and so there was a little bit of worry there, and you could see the three points, was, and it was that drive where you got the ball deep in TCU territory. Yeah, yeah. And you could just see the offense was kind of starting to stall a little bit, and TCU had kind of figured out the defense, and that's kind of the beauty of football, right, is the ebbs and flows of the game. You can you can dominate, but, you know, if you you got to play a full 60. And uh, luckily for the Cougs coming away, it did not feel like the Cougs ever really – this game was ever really in doubt for the Cougs. But overall, it was just a really solid performance. But three plays. So, um, the first one is Halsey's first interception in the first quarter. Um, Honestly, probably not an overlooked play, right? But it was the drive right after the uh, Cougars scored, and they go down, and then they get the interception. And the reason why I say it's kind of overlooked, maybe we're not overlooking it a ton. It was a big role, and you could see. And, and, you know, anybody going back would be like, oh, you point at turnovers, and those are kind of big plays that you kind of remember. But in that moment in the stadium – it felt really different than going back and watching it on TV. At that moment when Halsey gets that first interception, you could feel it in the stadium. And, it, and it's hard to describe, but you could feel TCU fans just kind of start to drop their head and go, oh, shit, here we go again, right? We've been turning the ball over a lot in, leading into this game. We're we're not we're we're kind of getting beat pretty easily by this Houston team, even though the scores you know showing seven nothing at that point. You hadn't really moved the ball if you were TCU, and the Cougars just went down and just ran the ball down your throats and had a good first drive as well. You had the interception and in the stadium, you could just kind of feel the atmosphere just kind of change. You could feel the Cougs start to get a little fired up. You could feel the U of H fans. I, there, there were a couple of clusters near me. I was by myself, but I could see a cluster in the sec, two clusters in the section next to me. And then a couple of rows in front of me, there were some U of H fans. And we could all kind of start to, we started looking at each other like, holy shit, what's happening here, right? And, and you could see the TCU fans kind of get a little panicked. So, I don't. I don't know if it qualifies as overlooked, but it. It. it I. I really felt it even you rewatching the game. You make I, a case. Yeah. Yeah. I. It really. You could just feel something was about to happen in this game after that. After that interception, um, with thirteen eighteen left in the second quarter, uh, Cooper and Carter uh, get to Hoover and it sets up a nice third and long. TCU was moving the ball uh, decently well, nothing too crazy, but uh, they get to Hoover, sets up the third and long. Next play, uh, actually, what was weird about the play is you see Cooper coming off the uh, off the edge. He's coming on the uh, 
on the quarterback blitz or the defensive back blitz, and 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 uh, the quarterback looks right at him. Hooper looks right at him, right at Carter, and it, it's so weird because anytime a quarterbacks know that you throw where the blitz is coming from, right? Like that's what you do. And if you look at the if you look at the DB coming off the edge, hit the hit the guy right there. There's there's going to be a bailout option right there. Throw it where he's not. And he looked right at him, took the sack. That led to the uh, second interception by Halsey. Basically was a uh, basically was a throw punt, an arm punt. But at the end of the day, you put him in that third long after that sack. And again, you could just start to feel the momentum for the Cougs was really moving on. Um, also, I just want to point out on Halsey's second interception that we got home with three blitzers, um, which great. Right, not gonna. That play wasn't overlooked, anything like that. But on one of one of the interceptions, we created pressure with three guys, and that is just massive. If you can get to the quarterback with three guys, you're gonna win almost every time. Right? Um, you didn't even have to bring a fourth. Right? You're, you're getting there quick with three all day, every day. But my third, my third play is a uh, 5:45 left in the game. That final drive, Donovan Smith is in, but uh, third and one. Cougs are kind of in field goal range, but I don't know if I trust our field goal kicking this year. Uh, Cougs are probably at about the 30, if I recall. It's going to be a 45-yarder. I don't guarantee it. If a field goal in this drive ends the game, right? Third and one, uh, Burnett gets stuffed at the line, but keeps his feet going, bounces it out, finds a hole, picks up four. And that was pretty much church. The Cougs needed probably one more first down to really ice it, which they got with the Donovan Smith keeper. But that third and one there, you knew you were going to be able to kill at least another minute and a half off of off the clock. It was all but done. There was about five minutes left. If you if you don't pick that if you if you don't pick that up, maybe you kick the field goal. But you give them another five to pick it up. You end up picking up the first down, so it didn't matter anyways. But that third and one was pivotal in the game and you may not think about it because the Cougs did pick up another first down you think of the field goal something like that so Sam what were your three so my first overlook play came from TCU's first offensive possession this game easy to forget now that we have the whole picture of what was a very good Cougar defensive performance that TCU was moving the ball reasonably well mm-hmm. on their opening possession got into Cougar territory and on third and five Josh Hooper Josh Hoover excuse me we call him Josh Cooper Josh Hoover completes a pass to Jeremy Payne, who is tackled between one and two yards short of the line to gain on a really nice open field tackle by Hershey McLaurin. I think I've we've both beaten this point to death on here, but I won't stop. We continue to see a level of tackling and certainly open field tackling that we hadn't the prior couple seasons. That good open field tackle keeps TCU from getting a first down or getting close enough to the line to gain that the quarterback sneak might have actually worked on fourth down. Uh, I denying that denying TCU an easy fourth down or the first down was really critical to, I think the Cougs building confidence on the road. You aren't in the position that you're in on fourth down there without a very good open field tackle on the play before by McLaurin. So that's my first play. My second one was on the U of H offensive possession that ended with the second touchdown of the game. It was Mm -hmm. part of one of my favorite, if not my favorite offensive sequences of the game. I think the big play from that drive, not the play I picked, but the big play from that drive was the 18 yard completion from Chris to Joseph Manjack, which ended up being the last play of the first quarter. But on the play, immediately- is that, sorry, just to, just to interrupt. Is that the play where Manjack ran the comeback and he catches it and he kind of makes a guy miss? Yes. Is that the play I'm thinking of? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Not I just want to make picked. sure I'm thinking of the right drive. Yeah. Not the play I picked, but the play immediately prior to that, Chris had a nice, a uh, quick nine yard completion to Jonah mm-hmm. Wilson on first down. It wasn't a super long throw, but one that required some touch. And I think this will be a common theme when we talk specifically about the Cougar offense. Most importantly, one that Zion Chris put in a spot where only his guy could conceivably get the ball. And I think that play was so important because it gives Chris just a little bit more confidence before a, the big play to Manjack that got you really deep in TCU territory. It allowed your play caller, Kevin Barbe to have the luxury of a second and one. There's no better situation for a play caller than second and short to go. You could take a slightly deeper shot down field and not worry about getting behind schedule and getting confidence and drive where you went up two touchdowns in the second quarter. I wasn't in the stadium like you, but I have to think agree. You know, I, I certainly understand the logic of, Hey, that whole C interception kind of started taking the air out of the building. 
I gotta imagine it was pretty fucking quiet after the Cougs went up fourteen nothing. That you gotta imagine that that was a real scary point for a TCU team that's just like, oh yeah, these guys look we haven't you know haven't looked great at times this year, but we're gonna be Houston. Gotta be Houston. Houston hasn't been that good, and to go down fourteen nothing, it had to be like a panic, a panic moment for everyone from the TCU sideline up to everyone wearing purple in the stand. So uh, my third and final play was from the third scoring drive. Of the game was a field goal drive. The Cougs. Uh, went up 17 nothing. wasn't even the longest run of the scoring drive that was Zion Chris doing having a 20 yard run at the start that got Uvich set up pretty nicely in TCU territory but the play I picked was a 12 yard run by Stacy Sneed he lowers his shoulder at the end and gets mm-hmm. an additional couple yards got the Cougars in the red zone it was a play that made me stand up from my seat watching this one in real time and I think in one play embodied how much tougher this entire team is than the previous couple Cougar football teams it was significant in that it was a run that I think firmly got you into field goal range, which you're probably only really comfortable, you know, inside of 40 yards with this group of kickers. But I think one that meets the definition of overlooked play, because it was a 12 yard run in a game where you've actually had multiple longer and I guess more noticeable big offensive play. So what I really like about this, Bobby is we've done six games now worth of this segment. I don't think we've ever picked the same three plays. I don't think we've ever had one yeah. where we're like, oh yeah, we both like we both organically ended up on the same one. And I think each time I don't think there's one where I go back and be like, ah, I think you or I really stretch the definition. Of that that's a really cool table setter to talking about the game itself. And we're gonna start with the offense. And for once it's gonna be a we're not starting with the offense because we want to get the m- most negative things we have to say out of our system. This this was by far the most complete performance by this offense in 2024. Yes technically you had more points against rice but i think considering your opponent easily the best performance of the season bobby why do you think things finally clicked for the offense on friday in fort worth and what things did you like the most from watching them i mean i think it's pretty easy and an obvious thing to point out and you know how much i hate just pointing to to one thing in particular um or or I, the right you know answer how, yeah quarterback i mean zion chris looked comfortable back there he threw the ball well um i just want to point out that first touchdown throw was perfect that throw could not have been a better throw from zion chris he couldn't have put that ball in any better of a spot than the one he did i think wide receiver made an amazing catch on it as well um you know you have a little bit of a height advantage there so took advantage of that maybe you throw that at the back pylon maybe but uh it was it was just out of reach of the defender. So um, quarterback play, I think, was a uh, was a big deal. Uh, but the Cougs also were able to establish the run pretty well. Um, even um, you know you had Burnett getting uh, 26 yards. Doesn't seem like a lot on 12 carries, um, but you know he kind of the bruiser and he picked up yards when he needed to. Uh, they had to respect Zion Chris. Um, I texted you this year in a game. There was a play where. Um, you saw the TCU defensive lineman untouched and he's just kind of standing there and he pauses for like a split second because he's playing some kind of contain. He's supposed to contain Zion Chris, but he realizes, wait, I'm untouched. I need to go after the quarterback. You know, uh, just that, just that little bit of being scared about what Zion Chris can do to you um, with his feet really changed the dynamic of the way you could just tell the way the defensive lines were, the defensive linemen were approaching. They couldn't go ears pinned back and just go after the quarterback. It was, wait a minute, I got to think about this for a second. There's a chance that I get burned if I don't. So um, I think I think that was a big plan or a big uh, a big a big thing there. I think uh, he had time to throw and he made decisions quickly. I think the O line played really well in this game. Um, there were some times, right? Um, I think. I pointed it one out to you where they ran a stunt. Uh, TCU ran a stunt, and you just saw a – they run a stunt. The guard, perfect. Plays it perfectly. Left tackle is like, oh, this guy disappeared in front of me. I don't have anyone to block. And then you watch Zion Chris get sacked. But overall, I think it was – Zion Chris was quick with his decisions. He had time to throw. He was able to create time himself. Um, you know, I, I guess – I'll sit here and eat a little bit of crow. I was like, I don't know if he's really the problem uh, or if Donovan Smith is really the problem. This O-line, uh, it's hard to evaluate it. Well, guys, Zion Chris looked like the truth on Friday. Uh, 12 of 15 for uh, – or 15 of 18. Sorry, I can do math. Uh, 15 of 18 for 141. Uh, 82.6 quarterback rating. You could just see 
it was different. Um, that 71-yard touchdown run, that was a dagger, right? You're in the stadium, you go, oh, yeah, maybe UH goes down here, kicks a field goal. Next thing you know, they score a touchdown. You're like, oh, wait a minute. And that is probably the most excited I've been watching Cougar football in a very long time in the stadium. I stood up and I was like, go, Zion, go! Because I'm very cognizant of like people around me when I'm at games. Like I don't want to stand up, especially on away games. That's a way that you you know start to get into a fight. That play, he broke it. And I was sitting high enough that I could see that he had nobody near him. So it was just like, go, go, go. So I think I think that was... A big, uh, uh, you know, to your point, it's the it's the right answer. He uh, he he made a huge difference, and and uh, the offense just clicked. They had the time; they could do what they wanted to. They ran what we thought this offense would look like. I think going into the season, if you would have told me that we were going to pass the ball twenty times, we were going to have forty four runs. Granted, that includes sacks. I would think that's how we're going to have to win football games this year. You know, and and to do it and it look good is exactly what I what I wanted to see out of this team. What about you? What'd you like and not like from the offense? I, I mean, like you, obviously, it all starts with Zion Chris. This was the the Chris I expected to see when he committed to the Cougs last offseason. Some work to do as a mm-hmm. passer, but capable of making good throws, decent arm, an ability to move the pocket. Obviously, with his legs, would be a super explosive runner when the offense needs it. It's hard for it's hard not to be the highlight when your quarterback has a 70 plus yard touchdown run for that not to be the game highlight. But I thought he made some really fantastic throws. I'm really glad you singled out that first touchdown pass because that was an eye opener for me. Because that's a that's a pass that required some touch and he put it where only his guy could get it. And I'm not going to turn all my thoughts in the offense into one long referendum on the guy who's been U of H's primary starting quarterback the last season and a half because Diamond Smith played a big part in sealing the win late. But I don't think I'm being unfair in saying that you didn't really see Donovan make that throw with enough regularity in his time mm-hmm. as the starting quarterback here. Maybe this is the staff empowering a bit. I, I'm really curious. The jump we saw, because we talked about literally one episode ago, Bobby. Like, How, how does this guy who is a, a, a pretty promising redshirt freshman starting quarterback in the Sun Belt in the games prior to this one not look at all confident as a passer? Either, not look like he's even out there to pass. Look like look like a running back getting a direct snap to go from that to a guy who no exaggeration. And again, that run was a big part of this game and Zion being able to change this game as a runner was important, but the Cougs got a two score lead because of Zion Chris's ability to throw the ball. Like let's make no mistake about it. Like the, the passing yards and the box score might not lead you to think like, Oh, this was a good passing performance. He wasn't asked to do it a ton. This was a good passing performance by Zion Chris. This this was a guy who did good things in the past game. It wasn't just a hold your breath and ah, they occasionally did something good there. This was, you chose to pass this number of times and when you did, it was extremely effective. I mean, because the staff empowering him a bit. And yeah, like we pointed out, how weird the prior several games looked to this one because even though Zion Chris is fairly young, it's not like this is his first time getting meaningful quarterback reps in a game. He started a good chunk of last season before a foot injury knocked out his last November. And I've been pretty harsh in criticizing UH's offensive coordinator, Kevin Barbe. We'll just add, when you get shut out two games in a row, some of that is invited, but I don't think I can praise him enough this week. Obviously, mm-hmm. Zeon Chris executing as well as he did was a big part of the offensive success. Any offensive play call- caller will tell you he's only as good as the quarterback leading the guys in the huddle. You didn't ask Zeon Chris to throw the ball 40, 50 times a game, and that is F-I-N-E fine. Like that wouldn't have been a good plan for a guy making his first career U of H start on the road against an opponent who's shown and still showed definitely in this one susceptibility to the run. This wasn't Chris in the offense succeeding in spite of a mediocre game plan. It was a very good game plan that was executed even better by the players. Uh, plenty of other guys, though, I think worthy of being singled out besides Zeon Chris. First of what I believe will be very many career rushing touchdowns in the Scarlet Albino for. Rashawn Sanford uh, on that touchdown on Sanford still found the end zone through basically, I think the entirety of his run was filled with contact. It's crazy how much of his yardage Sanford this year has come after contact. Like <laughs> imagine this guy, once he starts getting like decent size holes to run through, you saw that low center of gravity too. something we've seen in the past. Like UH has had a lot of smaller running backs over the, 
almost 20 years you and I have been fans of this program, but he's a smaller, smaller guy does not equal easy to bring down, especially with, when it's someone's Sanford size. And we saw, we saw it there. I'm glad you singled out Burnett. Uh, you know, I think if you had to guess for the fan base at large, the biggest challenge now is not getting completely over your skis about Zion Chris. It's like, Hey, this guy still has started less than 10 career games. He still has room to develop. And not that I'm not excited about Zion Chris, but I think for me, the thing I'm having to knock it over my skis about is how I feel about the combination of Rashawn Sanford and Jamarian Burnett in this program. Both guys, freshmen, uh, Burnett, I'm glad you singled him out because I, I think if you didn't watch this game, you wouldn't, you wouldn't appreciate the contributions of, you know, 12 carries, 26 yards. You'd see that and be like, ah, I didn't sound like he had a very good game, but he was asked pretty much exclusively to carry the ball in short yardage situations to have a guy who's one year removed from playing high school football, be ready to run, run against grown ass men. It, I think that's really impressive. And I, I think speaks to speaks to a long-term one, two combo in the backfield. It's going to be very, very exciting. You got another year. Stacy seat after this uh, mentioned his run earlier. So I'm not trying to diminish his contributions either, but that's a really exciting running game, man. It's not just Zion Chris, though. He's kind of the kind of the tip of the spear there. Zion Chris, take if you let if you'll let me, Bobby. Yep. I don't think we we've had good runners since Greg Ward. Like De'Aaron King and Clayton Tune, both were guys that you had to respect as a number in the run game. I think if Clayton Tune hadn't had the injury history he had, I think you have seen even more of him doing that over his career career. I still don't think we've had a runner as explosive as Zion Chris at quarterback since Greg Ward. Like, like just I agree. His his ability, like again, the other guys I mentioned, ability to be a number in the run game, had to get respect them, made exciting plays with their feet. But to house it from seventy yards out, like Chris did for that you know fourth score, and I think really almost the backbreaker for TCU, even though they had chances to get back in this game in the second half. Not something we've had before. That's what's such a tantalizing dimension um, of his game. You got to see Malik Carr also involved in the pass game. And that is a guy I want to keep seeing involved in this offense, even against Big 12 defenses. I don't believe there are a lot of guys out there who can, or defenses or opposing players who can keep that guy from not occasionally getting open like he did to positive effect against TCU. I mean, if I have any criticism, you got a bit more conservative in the second half, though this defense is good enough that I think you could at least wrap your head around doing that a bit more. Mm-hmm. And I'm a little sentimental. And while I would have loved for Zion Chris not to have had any kind of in-game injury stuff going on, you have to kind of enjoy Donovan Smith, who's had a tough season. He's had a tough career career. And it's just been criticized, not entirely incorrectly, uh, because being a college quarterback, that's part and parcel of being that. But I, I think... It's cool to see this guy come in there cold, lead this offense down the field for a clock bleeding game icing field goal drive in the fourth quarter. Really cool stuff. From what you told me, he was very much engaged on the, like, even, even less he was very much engaged with the mm-hmm. offense. That's, that's tough. Oh, yeah. like, uh, you're, you're a competitor. Like Donovan Smith wants to be the successful starting quarterback, this team bad, you know, more badly than you or I could even fathom this guy's this guy's a high level athlete it hasn't always gone right for him but this guy isn't a division one quarterback you know because all of his coaches are just like his personality like it even if you are a team guy it sucks to see like hey like oh this this guy's doing way better than this guy's honestly doing awesome they're not gonna be pulling me out of the game for this guy to have him stick in from what you and everyone else has told me still be engaged and still hyping his guys up and then going cold when his team really needs him and lead a drive where you really just needed to bleed clock and get one more score and truly put this game on ice. That's cool stuff. The offense didn't ask him to throw a lot there. He had that nice run on third and long, but that's, that's the cool stuff. Like that's, that's the kind of sports stories I really like. Where you say, sorry, dude, one of the, what I, what I meant with, they were all engaged. It was that final defensive drive and the offense was just on the sideline, jumping up and down, going crazy, talking mad shit. They were talking so much shit. Anytime anybody ran a play. And the number one person talking shit was Donovan Smith. I love it. I mean, the ball would, if, if somebody would come in, he's there. He's like, you got, you got. You could just see him going at it with the TCU guys. So he was hyped they were winning. And, and you know, ultimate team guy move, you know, all of that. 
you said it perfectly. But here's the other thing. Donovan Smith lost a lot last year, man. It sucks to lose. He's been out there where we've been getting our ass kicked. Even if you don't play, even if the other guy goes out and he, it's more fun in the locker room when you win. You know, it's you're having a better time when you win. Like it's just, I know I, I'm saying the obvious thing here, right? It's um, it's more fun when you win, but like you could tell he wanted to win, and there was just because he's out there with his friends and he's out there, you can just tell he is the leader of this team. And we've heard that from the coaches all year, right? That's one thing that they love about him is how he's the leader of the team. You can see that even if he's not point. You can see that he is one of those kind of guys. Yep. Uh, Same kind of general thought for your kicker, Jack Martin, who's once again your starting place kicker, hit three field goals to help secure the win. They were all field goals that I think Jack Martin should hit. I'm still happy he got kind of his redemption in this game as well. And my last two thoughts, I I said this to you via text message right before we went on air. It's not perfect yet. This offensive line, which was after week one, just this five alarm fire of, oh my God, I don't think I've ever seen a worse performance from a (laughs) group was a line to now incredible amount of improvement. And also I think given the career resume of the five or six guys who have mostly started versus you want to look at the five or six guys who started most of last season. I think you're getting a lot more positive stuff out of that unit. I mean, certainly in the run game. I mean, you've probably already had two rushing performances this year, just about better than anything you did last year. I mean, God, just running the ball was such a, such a trial and not a trial that uh, went really well during the Holgerson era. You're already getting more of that. Is it perfect? No. I mean, I wouldn't say all three of the sacks that Zion Chris took were, on Chris or on the O-line, I just feel like you're getting more at that unit in terms of who's starting there. What do you think realistically this group can do? And considering these guys have not played together as a unit in a game at all until the season, multiple guys weren't even in this program that are starting for you last year. I mean, you have one, you have one guy who started a significant amount of games this year, your center pancake hunter was a good recruit who did start at the very tail end of last year, but your center is a guy who started less than 10 career games. Like all, all signs that would point to this unit is going to be very, very bad this year. And I think I think they're a whole lot better than very, very bad. Is that kind of a backhanded compliment? Sure. But I, I think it is pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible we are here five weeks later where I'm saying something positive about the offensive line and their recent performance. And you're not just like, you're crazy, man. Like this is this is like it's it's significant improvement. And I think it speaks to speaks to a more coherent overall, just like this offense knows what it wants to be. Kind of like you were saying at the very top, is it always going to work as well as this? Probably not. Hope I'm I'm wrong there, but probably not. But there's a clear identity. You see what they want to be. And I think by the end of the season, certainly won't be anyone's best Cougar offense they've ever seen, unless this is your first, first season, but a clear plan for what this offense is. I, I think we're seeing it. And I think even with the last two shutouts, I think there are still reasons for optimism beyond just this game specifically. You're starting to see the vision of what this offense is supposed to be. And that's, that's pretty exciting. That, that is pretty exciting. You didn't just win this game via smoke and mirror. Sure. You now have some tape on Zion Chris, but I mean, Zion Chris has had tape on him for a while out uh, there. Zion Chris did start a chuckle last season. There's there's, believe it or not, Sunbelt film available for any, any opposing coach out there who wants it. So I, I think that's, that's the exciting big picture thing for me. It doesn't feel like there was a fluke. Like, will every game be as good as this? Hope so, but probably not. But you see a clear vision of what they want this offense to be, and that, that's what's so exciting to me. Well, let me let me t- have two more little things on the offense. Yeah, man, go I for was it. Listening, yeah. I was listening to one of our favorite podcasts, that isn't the Scott and Holman podcast, Split Zone Duo. And did you know they said this, and I had no idea, Zeon and Chris had the furthest in-air throw completion in fbs last year it, I, I had no, no idea way, way to work monday yeah I, yeah i heard that i was like really i did not i did not expect that so maybe you know we were criminally underrating his uh his throwing here so thought that was just a little interesting little tidbit to kind of share even if i knew you heard it i still wanted to kind of get that out oh, there yeah, and then yeah. two you you're starting to see the proof of concept. This game is the proof of concept for this offense. You're starting you're starting to see that this offense can be successful when done correctly. Big air quotes there, right? Big air quotes over when done correctly. That's a huge caveat to throw here. 
when done correctly, you're seeing that it can be successful and that it will be fun to watch. That was the other thing was the offense was fun to watch on, on, uh, on Friday night. It was, it, it was fun. I actually enjoyed, was it Case Keenum in 2008 throwing, you know, 60 yard bombs to Patty Edwards? No, but it's fun. It was a fun offense to watch. There wasn't a ton of tempo. There was enough to keep it interesting, but you didn't have to run, hurry up. You don't have to bomb it out. You can kind of play this different style than what we're used to. And you can, it'll look good when done correctly. It looks good. And it, is successful so hard to be uh even close to anything near upset with that fully agree i hate to give them second billing because this is also a very good cougar defensive performance as well you can make make an argument even though yes you allowed fewer points to rice yes you allowed fewer points to oklahoma though still good performance oklahoma looks like they have their offensive issues definitely your most complete performance we knew coming in tcu had an explosive pass attack almost certainly the best one this team had seen in the six game season this point offense gets lead billy because i mean we finally had a chance this season to talk about the (laughs) offense doing well against a decent opponent we had to take that but for the fourth time in six games now bob you got a performance from the cougar defense that you could find very little fault in and i would say for the fifth time which throw in the unlv game there your defense at least gave you a chance to win this football game not to get too big picture on a little picture situation that's exciting about this one, but consider what I just said and consider what a disaster this side of the ball was the previous two seasons and how now this defense is roughly 85, 90% new faces. And it continues to be absurd that Shia Wood has this defense playing this well, this quickly. It's it's almost impossible to overstate how ahead of schedule the Cougar defense is. So what were your big takeaways from this defensive performance against TCU? We got turnovers. That was huge, right? It has felt like, you know, I I didn't do the actual like research on this, but uh, it feels like we've gotten our butts whipped in the turnover game and the, and er, in the turnover numbers. And we got two good interceptions. One again, I said was the kind of like an arm pun. It was on third long and he threw it, you know, 40, 50 yards down the field and it was intercepted, but still you get that interception. The ball kind of bounced your way a little bit on, on fumble recoveries. I know that's not defense related. You were getting to the quarterback. Hoover didn't have a lot of time to throw when he did. He was able to pick us apart, but you saw pressure getting to the quarterback in a way that we haven't seen since probably 2021, that 2021 team, the, uh, the, um, that U of H defensive line, defensive front, um, you know, it was really good to see Michael Batten after what looked like a career ender last week when he jumped up and he lands. He's got, I think he had a couple of sacks. He had a fumble recovery. Guy just had, have yourself a game, buddy. Yeah, uh, Batten has a, uh, recovers a fumble. Batten's uh, six tackles uh, and a sack. Just What a game by Michael Batten. And let me just talk about how we have a guy on our team who might, you you could make an argument that he could be, except for one guy, there's there's one guy uh, who plays for Colorado who could make an argument for being defensive player of the year over him. A.J. Halsey, seven tackles, pass deflection, just two interceptions. What? What else can you ask for out of a defensive player, out of one of your DBs? What a what an absolute stud he's been this year. AJ Halsey has been an amazing, amazing player this year. Just want to shout him out. I know I seem to give him a shout out every week, but the guy is bringing it every week, and he is just performing in a way that we just haven't seen from a defensive player in a while. AJ Halsey was one of those guys when kind of the the twenty four roster was forming, and you're like, okay, who's going to be back? Who, who, ha- who has eligible to get back and all that stuff. And it was clear that, okay, he's not going to be one of the first group of guys leaving. And it's just like, no one really stood out in last year's defense because, you know, last year's defense wasn't especially good. But he was one of those guys, like, okay, but I could see him being a promising guy to build. I could see him with a better scheme and guys around him playing better to be to be capable of being a standout player in a good defense. He's been everything there and then some. I, I think we've kind of 
skewed heavier to talking about the defensive front when we talked about the Cougar defensive performances, but all the guys we've highlighted from that group, AJ Halsey has been as important, as big of a part of this defense's successes as any of those guys who singled out. And you mentioned the turnover luck, and that, this could be an offense or defense. Thing. And it's it's true. There, there were some fumbles that had fortuitous bounces U of H's way. Josh Hoover is extraordinarily lucky that he did not throw three picks in this one. This was uh, on mm-hmm. TCU's uh, first touchdown drive because he throws a ball. I almost think the U of H guy was surprised it was going to him. Doesn't get it, and then immediately TCU has two big chunk plays. I believe a run and then a pass immediately after that. So, yes, the Cougars got some uh, some some fortunate, I, I think, fumble luck offensively that they really haven't gotten prior to this season. But I think TC TC was lucky. They also had, I would say, the worst non called hold. It was on Keith Cooper on ended up being their second <laughs> touchdown drive. I, I yes, I I've. Believe it or not, I have mostly trained myself from being the yells at TV while watching game guys. Certainly about a call because it's just like, no, the ref in Fort Worth cannot hear me yell at my <laughs> flat screen. But the right tackle is holding Cooper. I'm just like, it's a fucking hold. A lot enough that I'm sure my neighbor uh, could have heard. Like I was very unhappy uh, about that one. But a, a great performance talked about Michael Batten. Like you, like you said, what a single out one play here. I have not seen many guys less ready for contact than it was on third and very long. A TCU running back is trying to do blitz pickup on Michael Batten. And it's like, it's like the guy's barely there. I don't think it's for <laughs> lack of trying. I don't think it was like, Oh, the guy shy away from contact. It was, it was one of the guy was like one of those little half ass speed bumps. You see sometimes just like, yeah, I know your intention is to slow people down, but I don't think <laughs> you're doing that. And yeah, great, great play. Had bad there as part part of a game where we had a lot of a lot of great ones. We've said it on here before. This defense didn't have a Michael Batten on it last year, and it is it is very clear the difference that this guy's making. I almost had this one as one of my overlooked plays, Bobby Carlos Allen. It ended up being on a TCU scoring drive, which is kind of why I put it by a little pool of like, hey, this could be an overlooked play. But he makes a lateral play to him and someone else in the open field to get Josh Hoover, the TCU quarterback, when he tried to do a keeper there. And if no, I had that, that play written down too. I had you? that play written down too. Uh, yeah, great minds. A play with a, a linebacker does it. You're like, okay, like you know, did decent play there, but you expect that. But not like a 5'11", 300 pound like defensive tackle. Like a guy that size shouldn't be moving like this. It is remarkable. Like this guy was playing for FCS Kennesaw State until this year. There, are, there are in this era where you have fewer diamonds in the rough. You have fewer guys that get overlooked by the big recruiting industrial complex. It is incredible to see this guy. like, Oh yeah, this guy is a big 12 defensive talent. This guy should be on a good big 12 defense. And up until yep. this year was playing for Kansas state. I mean, great, great eval by the staff, but obviously a guy, a great athlete who was clearly ready for a higher level of competition than the one he was facing. That, that was just one of those plays that I wanted to single out there. Hershey. Mag- out. Yeah. Hershey McLaurin. Mentioned him for the overlook play. Can't be a buried lead on this one. Really nice play. Momentum shifting in the gameplay. Punching the ball at JP Richardson's uh, what a play. arms. Yeah, I feel I feel like any momentum that at that point TCU was trying to claw back. I think that was the last point in the game where I really felt worried about the outcome. I really felt like, oh man, like TCU could get control of this game. Then Hershey McLaurin punches the ball back out. Cougars get it. You get the lead back to eight points, even though you probably would have liked to touch down that team in their territory. But great play by this defense to get the ball back to the offense, kill any momentum that your opponent had. Really, really going there. McLaurin, McLaurin's a guy I feel like we mentioned almost weekly, and, and I think rightfully so. Uh, someone you have a returning guy like Halsey who he singled out, rightfully so. Like he's someone who clearly benefited from the new scheme, from a staff with a better idea of how to build a successful college defense, but. You didn't have Hershey McLaurin. Like, you didn't have Michael Batten last year. You didn't have Hershey McLaurin last year. And, boy, this defense looks a whole lot better for those two guys being here. We've been beating the drum on this pod all season that even when some games like UNLV or Iowa State end with not great-looking opponent rushing totals, this is still a capital G good run defense. It didn't hurt mm-hmm. that you put – good complimentary football, you put TCU in a multi-score hole and probably – less willing to run the football than if this was a close game for a lot longer, but you were never, they were never able to really run things balanced. And when they did, yeah, Cam cook had some nice runs for TCU, but never really were able to change the game with 
with them running the ball. Anytime, unless you are facing vintage Michael H. May, rest in peace, Texas Tech, if your opponent is running for under 100 yards, chances are it's a good game. When you're forcing as many turnovers, like you mentioned earlier, chances are it's a good game. The, the big stat heads really struggle to find sometimes, like, okay, what correlates with winning? Like, if a team does this, like if a team passes for more yards, if a team more pelt, like, do, what correlates with winning? And the thing that I feel like they found the most correlation is turnovers. If you if you are giving the ball away less than your opponent, chances are you're going to win. Chances are you're going to win by a pretty decent margin. That's what the Cougars did uh, on Friday night. This was T, uh, TCU's lowest passing output of the 2024 season, their lowest points output in the current season. I mean, for any of that team's faults, TCU hadn't been held under 30 points by anyone this season. The Cougars did it, and the Cougars did it by a pretty good margin, which that's really cool. Uh, something that I don't think is offense or defense specific, if you'll allow me, that probably should talk about this point. Bobby, the Cougs didn't beat the Cougs. The yep. Cougs absolutely. didn't beat the Cougs. Yep. I can't imagine how happy Willie Fritz is that didn't have a special teams penalty, didn't have very many, didn't have very many penalties, period. And I, I honestly wasn't a big fan of some. Like, I, I, I remember just right after they didn't call OPI, which I don't think it was a really blatant OPI, but I thought I thought TCU's first touchdown was a little OPI on their receiver there. Did mm-hmm. not call that. And then the next possession, UVH gets a real sketchy defensive PI called on. Can't say I was very happy with that. You yep. know, but, but this is this is not my extended bitch about the ref segment. This is to say that even the penalties that U of H got. I didn't look at that and be like, oh, what's that guy doing there? Just like, ah, I sort of see why they made the call. It's kind of borderline. I don't, I don't, I'm not mad at the player for it. I, I don't think the player did anything bad there. Uh, I, I just, mm-hmm. you saw how good this team can be if they're not just shooting themselves in the foot constantly. Like you saw that right. if you're not playing with that handicap that you kind of, like even the Rice game, there were a lot, there were some sequences of the Rice game where you committed a good number of penalties. Like the penalty yardage wasn't great at the end of that, but it's like, okay, like, you played better than other facets, and you were also playing a frankly terrible opponent. Like that, that can make up for it. You weren't playing a terrible opponent this week. You were the more disciplined team. Is it going to be this good every week? Coming to the offense, probably not. Like you, you will probably have it. Hopefully, not many, but at least one or two more games this year where just pen- penalties are a problem. Even the best teams oftentimes have problems, or at least one or two games that have problems with penalties. But like the offense, you could see the vision. You could see a more disciplined, purposeful team in this game and ideally, you know, by the end of the season and certainly the seasons to come, you're seeing something like that. Most Saturdays. Like I think that's what makes this win in the big picture. So valuable is I think it wasn't just, okay, I'm, we're happy to beat rice. And we finally got that. This is a, we beat a big 12 opponent. We did it by being the more disciplined, more purposeful, the, the tougher team. And that was something this fan base, I think needed to see when it was kind of really at a low ebb the week before at, one and four overall and back-to-back shots for the first time in 30 years. It was, it was really, this was a win this fan base needed to see. This is a win to kind of calm the nerves. Hey, like this season still might be tough. You still might be 13th, 14th, 15th best in this league. When it's all said and done though. I, I, you know, have hope for the senior better than that, but you could see the vision. You could see what this program can. And I think will eventually be under Willie Fritz. And that, that was cool. And I think embodied by the penalties. So, any other defensive thoughts, big picture thoughts you got there, bud? Oh, I got I got one more when you're done. So you you do your thing. I no, I am no, no, no. You've uh, you've you've said a lot of just how I should feel about this game and how Cougar fans should feel about this game. There is uh, the Cougs didn't beat the Cougs, right? We, we I think that's been one of our biggest complaints and no special team penalties, if I recall. No um, penalties, buddy. Which which has just been one of those things that. For some reason, special team penalties feel worse than a regular penalty because, like, you're running down the field, throw a block, let the guy – he can call a fair catch. Like, let him – like, if you get beat, I'd rather him call the fair catch and not get the hold than you hold him and then him still have to call a fair catch, right? So that's big. Just overall, it just feels like this team – this is starting to – it's honestly how you kind of expected this year to go, right? You you come out. You, maybe you want to win that first game against UNLV. Maybe you think you can out-talent them. But that UNLV team is starting to show that they are actually a really good football team. Um, and you you knew that the team that you saw in September wasn't going to be 
or late August, early September, I think was like the first, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it was it going to be the team that you saw in mid October? And to be honest, it's starting to show, right? We're starting to really be able to tell that this is not the same team. It already looks wildly different than it did in the first game or two of the uh, of the year. And you could see the last two games that the defense has really started to turn and we needed to get the offense. And this offense looks different than it did the week before, which looked different than the week before, which looked different than the week before. Yeah. I think something I said on this show, and this is the most enjoyable, the most enjoyable thing though. I hope it's something we reach the point where I hope we reach the point where Cougar men's basketball is where opponents are consoling themselves. Like, Oh, well Houston's Houston's really good. You know, man, we just had to wash that in. I think it was like for some reason it was the K State game last year. We just like just ate their lunch at the Fertitta Center last year, and they're just like, ah, you know, what? you just gotta gotta throw that. That's Houston. That's just what Houston basketball does. I love for Houston football to reach that point. Until then, though, it was just absolutely glorious. I don't really have any a special dislike of the TCU fan base. I don't. I, don't, I mean, I, I want to beat them maybe like ten percent more because it's another Texas school, but I, I don't have any strong negative or positive feelings towards TCU. Great to see that fan base just absolutely lose their mind from losing to us. Like, what I just, did I tell you? Just, what no, did I tell you? No, that it's like, oh man, you did like it wasn't just a loss. Like you just like you made these guys question their season. You just removed the life, uh, the hope that Horn Frog fans had for this season. Like uh, that's yep. just that, that is that was fantastic. That was chicken soup for my soul. Even as someone who doesn't really have any a special strong dislike to TCU would love, would love to kind of do a repeat of this in a month and change against Baylor to do the final, final nail in the coffin of Dave Aranda's time there to beat those fools uh, a second season in a row. But I'm telling you that is going, if we win, he is gone. Oh yeah. I will bet. I will bet money that if they lose to us, he will be gone. Yeah, and you could see, too, you yeah. could see, you could see what I was talking about. It, and it seemed it seems like our, uh, our our guest last week, who was great, kind of really scoffed at the idea that it would make his seat warmer. That it no, would I mean, be. I'm talking, about Dave Aranda. No, I'm talking about Dave Aranda. No, no, no. And I'm saying, but I'm saying, oh, yeah. going back to to uh, TC uh, TCU's coach, it's it's very. You could see it was kind of one of those things where it was like, oh yeah, no, if if we lose to you guys, it it'll be okay. But I think most reasonable reasonable people, and it's like. Then you go to his, uh, you go to his, whatchamacallit, his, uh, you go to his Twitter page after the game, and it was crazy. They hated it. They were so mad. And I like the TCU fan base. I grew up in DFW. I, I just, I, I've, I went to TCU games as a kid sometimes, occasionally. So, like, I like them. They're cool. They're fine. They were well, super sorry, nice to a, me at the a, game. A G five team that won so often that the big boys club had to let them in. It was, it was had no choice. Super aspirational programs like U of H was at one time. Yep. At least for me. Yep. But it was just it. It's just it, you're right. It was. It is funny watching them just absolutely, completely melt down. And they're a private school, so we'll never truly know the dollar amount. But man, imagine being like financially tied. I mean, I guess you you don't have to imagine that hard. We were just financially tied for large sums of money to Dana Holger. So which I don't think it's any better yeah. than that. Really. But imagine being tied that much money to Sonny Dyke. So I, I'm sorry. Like he's had some good offenses. He's like won some interesting places. Like winning at Cal that year he had Jared Goff. Winning at Cal is hard. Winning at La Tech like that last year he was there. That offense just scorched us in 2012. They were such a fun team to watch. But like you look at his career. This is like a, it's a guy who wins seven, eight games a year. Like, that's what Sonny Dyke does. They win seven, eight games a year. He has exciting offense, defense optional, and just never a team capable of, of really winning at a high level. A, a team that, that's going to often beat itself and stuff like that. So whatever happens to U of H the rest of the year, you could just, you know, I guess take some solace in the fact that the right guy, the right staff are in charge right now. And that, that this, what you saw on Friday night might not be every single week the rest of the season, but this this will be this program. Willie Fritz, I'm putting my line in the sand here. We will win again. Like this game, this will be the fucking norm for this program. I swear to you. Yep. I believe it with everything in me that that's going to be the case. And that's, that's what's so cool about it. And so it's a good. Yeah, I agree. 
Oh, oh, hold on. Yeah. Got, oh, got a bra- no, we can end it. I yeah, was going to say. Got to talk, got to talk about our picks here. Uh, yeah, obviously, normally more robust schedule here, but both of us have had a tiny fraction of the amount of time for prep this episode as usual. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to honestly disrespect the other sports. Noble stuff to talk about. We will catch up next episode. We've got, we've got football off week here coming up. So we got plenty of time to catch up on everything else. Cause there's a fair amount of stuff happening in, in Cougar athletics. Bobby was, Bobby was in person to watch the tennis program. The golf women's golf program did something awesome. Cougar volleyball is obviously in season and doing good stuff there. So we'll come back and talk about all that stuff, but this is going to be a rare football only episode from us going to close here talking about our picks our weekly segment down with the picknest today just a review of our picks from last week i had probably my pick of the year and yet yet bobby i still trail you you have just over 1320 pod bucks i am the betting I have, god i just have over 1253 despite my correct prediction of uh u of h winning this one outright with the money line so they had paid out five and a half to one so this paid out for my 35 uh, fake pod bucks bet, 227 uh, pay fake dollars. We're not encouraging you to be a uh, a gambler, though. We're not encouraging. <laughs> We're not encouraging, but uh, somehow Bobby and I are both multiple hundreds of dollars up on our uh, imaginary starting total. So I picked that correctly. We also both correctly picked the game total under 49 and a half points. Just got under at 30 to 19. Difference being Bobby also correctly took uh, UH the point spread. And I incorrectly took the first half under of 25 and a half points, which was my biggest of the three bets I made this season. I am, I am an even 500 this year. I'm as good as a coin flip. I'm six and six. Uh, my co-host here is, is a much uh, healthier uh, six and four. On Let's the go. <laughs> so I, I'm trailing in both record and imaginary pod bucks, but I, I will take some small solace in the fact that for the, for the first time in my life, not that I'm a current active, uh, sports better i i am up significant amounts of money uh on my starting total so that's that's clearly the, that's a the positive that's a I positive have only, i have to only bet on u of h i have to it has to only be imaginary money if the real money comes in uh my mojo and your mojo clearly both that is correct here. that is yeah. correct that is correct so are we doing a win bobby uh it's a really fun time I, no, it, it, so much better it's so yeah. much better I, especially like going back and look I say this every week, but going back and trying to find three plays is so much easier when it's kind of a close game, whether we win or we lose. Like it was much easier to find them during the OU game than it was losing 34 nothing. You're just like, well, this was over at halftime. I got to find three plays that influence the outcome of this game. This game was never in doubt. <laughs> I just think the fact that rewatching the Cincy game. D- didn't enjoy not any part of watching no. it. And the fact that I had to do at least <laughs> a one and a half rewatch of that. Not not fun. Yeah. Not complaining about what I do. Like I, I, I enjoy podcasting very much. Good good times and bad. Like if if we were like I, I think about like the Alabama loss to Vandy and just like whatever. If I happen if the circumstances happen to be that I was an Alabama fan or I went there for my undergrad or something like that. Whatever. Cool. But I almost feel like that's almost a more miserable experience because it's just like oh if we don't win eleven to twelve games, I'm just miserable about it. And that that's yeah, like, I'm it's disappointed. Really a bad I'm way disappointed. to be a fan. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, just, you know, national titles are fun though. Oh yeah, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't see that U of H somehow in the next ten years turning itself into uh, into. A new and group. I kind of think of, that's kind of our basketball program right now. We're kind of like that. If we if we lose yeah. to a team like a Vanderbilt, you know, a, a basketball equivalent of Vanderbilt, we'd be like, what the fuck, you know? So. What you what what you were you not a lot? I mean, I guess no one technically saw that one because it was COVID. But like, I mean, you were around for the ECU game, uh, were you not? Uh, anyway, anyway, yeah, not to bring up bad memories. This, uh, anyway, enjoy the winning pod. It's all we got this week. Bobby, take us home. Well, guys, that is it for this week's podcast. Even though it's shortened, we had to shorten it up. Like like Sam said, he's busy with work. I'm literally in a hotel room. If you're watching on video, you can see like my dirty clothes. Uh, so uh, that is it for this week's podcast. But if you do want to reach out to us, you can always find us on social media. Uh, Sam primarily runs that account. Dustin is still on it a little bit, but you can find us on Twitter at SH Potty. Actually, Dustin's been tweeting more since he stopped being a regular <laughs> host. We'll see if that so, um, uh, You can find us at SH Podcast on Twitter. Um, you can find me if you're looking for just me. You can find me at number one Coog. You can also find just Dustin 
on uh, Blue Sky uh, podcast.bsky.social. You can find him there. And if you hate social media, if you uh, decided to give up social media in 2024, good for you, first of all. Second, you can always email us on uh, shpodcast at gmail.com. You can always reach us there. If you have listened to all of this and you were like, hey, those guys, he's he's podcasting from his hotel room and uh, Sam's podcasting in between work events. Those guys hustle for this. I want to throw them some money. You can always find us on patreon.com. Uh, SH podcast on there. If minimum five dollars gets you premium post game content, gets you some other fun stuff that we are uh, kind of hoping to get done at some point in our lives um, when our schedules meet up. Five dollars is the minimum. Uh, maximum is unlimited. Depends on who you are. If you want to give us a hundred dollars, you can. If you want to give us five thousand dollars, five million dollars, five hundred million dollars. If you work for will... Sovereign Wealth Fund and want to get into the <laughs> podcast space, uh, shoot us an email. SH podcast If you're if you're very interested in a podcast that some of your employees might be interested in because Houston and all of that, maybe, I don't know, uh, you can always reach out to us uh, via Patreon or shpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to talk to you. And after this about an hour-long podcast, even though we said we were going to cut it That's short, after about, long podcast. After, after about an hour long of podcasting, it is time for me to go eat. It is time for Sam to go do his work thing. But we will not leave without saying... Go Cougs!